Promises. We're thinking about promises. And it's pretty easy to make promise. It's something else to keep the promise. I mean, we make promises all the time. Hey, I'll take care of that for you. And then psh, out of mind, out of sight, forgot, right? Didn't follow through. At work, you know, the boss promises that bonus when you complete the task. But it doesn't come, right? Promise unkept. At home, mom and dad says, hey, we'll be there for your game. You can count on it. And your middle, middle school daughter's playing her heart out in a basketball game. And you got delayed, got hung up. You couldn't make that, right? Unkept promise. Husband, you promised to get that new garbage disposal and install it. Good thing for you, you did not give a completion date. So you can still keep the promise. Next year, you know, I promise. High school junior says to dad, dad, if you just let me use the car this week, you know, no school, I just need that car. I promise that once a month I'll wash your car in the summer. I can see myself now doing it for you, dad. You know, we, we learn pretty quickly in life that a promise is only good as the one giving the promise. We find out there's too many promise makers and not enough promise keepers. This morning, as our theme is Jesus the Supreme One, we come to our conclusion to realize that he is this promised one of God from a long time ago, from the start of time and history, that this Messiah, this promised one, will come. And if, Christ, if God makes that promise, as he is the faithful God of, of righteousness and truth and faithfulness, he's going to keep that promise because he is God. This morning, I want us to explore the fullest way that we can, Jesus being the Messiah in the time that we have. We won't land on one passage. We're going to use a number of key passages for that. You got your outline, and if you can look at it, it's a book. But it's better for you that it's a book. When I teach on the Messiah, i got to put a lot of stuff in it, and that just means I'm not going to read it. You have to. So you can make a promise and never do it. That's okay, I guess, but not today. All right, so that's where we're heading. And uh, I hope we have some fun as we go through our time thinking of Jesus being this Messiah, this promised one. And being that, Right? He is Savior. He's our Redeemer. But he's this one who's going to come, and he is going to come again. And I want us to catch that truth this morning. So we want to begin by going to that point of time when Jesus is declared to be the Messiah. Right? First principle in your outline, point one. God keeps his promises. The fulfillment's first installment, the Messiah, has come. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 1, which is the announcements of the birth of the Christ, the Messiah. In verse 26, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her that she's going to bear the, the son, this one son, the son of God. In verse 31, Mary is going to become pregnant, and her son will be named Jesus, right? That's the Greek word. Hebrew word is Yeshua, right? Shortened form for the word name God, Yah, Yahweh, Yeshua, God saves. That's the English translation. We talk about Jesus, we're talking about God saves, right? That's his name. Verse 32 Look at the description. He'll, he'll be great. He'll be called son of the most high. Literally, it's son of highest. The definite article is not used. So in the Greek, it has that sense of an absolute uniqueness. Son of highest. He's set apart from all others. We have that familiar phrase. He'll be on the throne of David. Old Testament promise coming true in Mary's child. Amazing. This promise that we want to look at, this ruler on David's throne, it can't be another human, just another human being. Obviously, as a baby born to Mary, it's human, but, but more than that, it's all, he's also God because he's going to be eternal king. Point B, the birth of Jesus as Messiah is announced, right? And we looked at this text last week, chapter 2. Turn there, and the angels declared to the shepherds. The shepherds were of the, the lowest class of occupation you can have there in Israel and the angels deliver that message. And the angel said, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord. And we think of those words, right? The Savior, the Redeemer, the Rescuer. He's Messiah. That's Hebrew. The, the Greek word is Christos, Christ. And the English translation would be anointed one, this promised anointed one of God. 
and he is Lord, ruler, king, master. God delivers on his promise. He is the faithful promise keeper. We got to remember that when we don't maybe feel it. Point two, I want us to see that God uses promise givers, the prophets, to deliver the promise. Let's explore that with a couple of questions. First question, point A is, well, how, how much did the prophets understand? Answer that. Let's turn to 1 Peter 1. Would you do that? Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter 1, some key verses there. Peter's writing to the church that has been dispersed because of persecution there in, in Asia Minor, in Turkey. Most part made of Gentile Christians. And, and, and let's think about how much did the prophets understand? Let's ask a couple more questions of that. First question is, be, well, what were the prophets speaking about? What did they speak about? Peter begins this letter to them, as in verse 10, you see the phrase, concerning this salvation. So he's been, just been writing in verses 3 through 8, 3 through 9, about salvation. And now he's addressing it, concerning this salvation. Look back at verse 9 and 8 and 9. And he says, for you are receiving. This is how he ends that first section. For you are receiving the, 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 the result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And so he's going to continue a little bit writing on that verse 10 concerning this salvation. And he writes that the prophets of old spoke about the grace, as he's writing to these people, the grace to the church, the grace that has come to you and, and to us as the receivers, the recipients of the grace of God through Jesus Christ. We have this unearned favor from God, and the prophets are saying, this grace has come to you, believers, the church. The spokesman for God knew that this salvation was for those who were beyond themselves, beyond them. Second key question. What did the prophets themselves understand about, understand what they were speaking about? Did the prophets understand what they were speaking about? I want to say yes, yes they did. And this is important. There, there's two opinions out there. Some within the free church and, and some very highly great trained minds and theologians and there's others in the circle that I would agree with great godly men and women who would hold a differing viewpoint so there's a different viewpoint out there. and and there's that viewpoint that would say that uh, that God gave two levels and we looked at this uh, four weeks ago two levels of understanding there was a there was the lower meaning that the prophets understood and there was this higher meaning that the prophets couldn't grasp Personal note, it bothers me that any biblical scholar would say that they can figure out what God is saying more than what the prophets said. And that bothers me. I, I, I don't, wouldn't have the audacity to say that. I don't think anyone should say that. I can't, all I know is what's in print. I know what was declared and what was written down for us. So there's this, this meaning, right? And, and, and key for me is that those who hold, and I think this is in this group of those who are premillennial in their sense of Jesus Christ is going to return before the thousand-year reign, right? That, that, that the scriptures declare that Jesus is going to do that. We see that clearly written in Revelation chapter 20. And again, there, there's freedom of, among evangelicals to disagree on that. When we, when we interpret scripture, and this is a key point for me, the what is given by the prophet has to have meaning, genuine meaning for the recipients as they hear the prophet speak. They've got to say, this is what God is saying. I, I don't believe God was pulling the wool over any of the recipients from the prophets. That there was this lower level, but then God was hiding from them the deeper level of meaning. Granted, the prophets didn't necessarily understand all the details, but what they did understand, it was the truth that God wanted expressed. Those of us who would say, hold to this view of interpretation that there are not two levels of understanding. Obviously, God reveals more and more over time, and that does not negate what the prophet, earlier prophets said, nor what those earlier recipients understood. An example, 1,700 years before Christ, you have Jacob, whose name's changed to Israel. Genesis chapter 49. 
before Jacob goes home to be with God, right? He speaks his blessing on his sons. And he comes to his son, Judah. And he tells them that out of you will become this ruler of which there will be obedience to him. More than just the king of Israel. Got that. He understood that. This ruler is going to come out from Judah. Now, that's a pretty small band, but it's still the truth. You get to, you cut off a thousand years. Now we go 700 years BC. And Jacob would not have known the delivery system of that ruler who's going to come. He wouldn't have known that it was, because God didn't tell him. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. He doesn't know that. But he says what he knows. And then you get to Isaiah, right, as we've studied in Isaiah, a thousand years later, so 700 BC, God tells him that this, this, this child will be born of a virgin and give birth to this, this one. We have Emmanuel, God with us. And Isaiah got the delivery system, but he didn't know who it was. He didn't know the circumstances necessarily of Mary and Joseph. You know, when we understand end times teaching, this argument is really important from my point of view, because I believe when the scriptures are given to Israel and Israel's involved, there's a physical Israel involved in these promises and the church doesn't replace Israel. That's an important piece. Again, there's disagreement over that. It can be, and that's fine. But, but that's my viewpoint and I can't see it that Israel gets scratched away. When I was at Wheaton College studying and I was a Bible major there and we had to read minor, um, some commentaries of minor prophets and on the assigned reading list and I get that commentary and I read it and I call my dad up and I said dad I don't understand this commentary guy is writing all about the church in the Old Testament the church the church the church the church the church the church I'm going what is he talking about so my dad explained to me some things I never heard before about reformed theology and all of that going together and, and, and that the church is replaces Israel and the promises to Israel and I can't I don't hold that I can't and I agree with those who don't now you're getting Bubar's viewpoint. It's too bad. <laughs> you're there, I'm here. But all right. I want to make the point that the prophets understood and the recipients understood exactly what God wanted them to know. They didn't miss anything more than what God wanted them to know at that point in time. Second question. Did the prophets themselves understand what they were speaking about? And I'm going to say clearly, yes. Back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. And so point A, we see the action, the action of the prophets. He, Peter says they searched intently and with greatest care. These two words are used interchangeably. They were careful as they studied, diligent. Point B, the goal of the prophets was to find the time and the circumstances of the Messiah's sufferings and the glory that would follow. Do you see it? That's what Peter declares. God, God, God didn't give those prophets all those details. So they're searching and they're hunting diligently for more information. The NIV translation is a great translation here. They didn't know the timing of the Messiah. Indeed, it was future, but they didn't know when it was, how it would come about. Similarly, they didn't know the circumstances around his coming. But they did know that it was all about the future. I'll give you my favorite diagram uh, of what the prophets saw out there. It's in your outline, and it comes from William Newell, who was writing this at the turn of the 1900s. And he is, his, his viewpoint is that time runs horizontally. And, and, and then running toward the end of time, right? We, that's what we would always think. It runs toward the end of time. And the prophets foretold, right, that the end comes with the coming of the Messiah. And so the Messiah comes, and now what happens? Well, Time turns 90 degrees, and we're not running towards the end because the Messiah has come up, but we're also running along the edge when the Messiah is going to come again. So we're living on the brink, on the edge of the end of time and all that it holds and entails. And a precise moment, he comes, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, and, and there's, there's going to be this great tribulational period and there's going to be a rapture scripture talks about that snatching away is it before in the midst of it, at the end we can talk about that and disagree on that but there will be a rapture snatching away of the believer the church the body of christ at the during at the end during in the midst of it's going to happen then comes we know scripturally the the battle of armageddon christ returns then and establishes his kingdom on earth 
followed by eternity. For the believer, eternity in heaven. For the non-believer, eternity in hell. Today, we don't, we don't know the timing of when that end breaks in, right? When Jesus is going to return. But we can be sure the Messiah is going to come again. The Old Testament prophets, they all looked ahead as to when the Messiah was coming. And, and he comes with salvation, right? A salvation, we read in Peter, for a future people group, not Israel, not just believing Israel. There's a third question we can ask. How much did the prophets know? Again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. And, and we see that they understand that the, this Christ would suffer first, and then secondly, glories would follow. And they knew what they were speaking about and writing about that much, at least, of the Messiah. Those three truths. Let's look at the text. The prophets knew the Messiah was going to suffer. Secondly, the prophets knew that he would receive glory. And they stopped. They wrote about the, the reign of the Messiah, right? But they're searching because they also knew one more truth that stands out in that passage. They also knew it was suffering before glory. Suffering first. Glory to follow. Three truths. We know from what Paul wrote in chapter 2 in that beautiful passage in Philippians. You know, Christ leaves the presence of God, the presence of God comes to this earth, and he dies on that cross for us. But then what? God exalts him to the highest place. He comes, he suffers, he is exalted. Next question, point B. Did the prophets have a totally clear view of the future? Obviously, No. They saw only what God intended them to see. You know, when you're looking to the future, it gets a bit fuzzy out there. We look back and we always see clear because we know that hindsight is 2020. You know, and the, and the New Testament writers, they can turn around and write back and talk about the prophets and Isaiah and what they wrote, and, and they could say, well, this is what that is because they're looking backwards. But when you're looking ahead, it's just a bit harder to do. So what did they see out there? Point one. The prophets did, didn't see, did, didn't clearly distinguish between the two comings, right? Let's make it clear as Peter does. What they did understand is the Messiah is going to suffer. He's going to, he's going to receive glory. But the one comes before the other. It's all future, so it's hard to differentiate. Secondly, I want us to see a, a little illustration of this. You know, we, we, um, we got four pillars here, right? Am I right, four? You got the best view of them right out there. And um, we can tell, and there's distance between each of them. The distance between column number one and two is nine and a half feet. The distance between columns three and four, don't guess, because you won't guess, it's ten and a half feet. Now, I can figure that out. There's, there's two-foot tiles. I do it all the time. I can count two by two, four, six, eight, and I can figure that out. So could you. The distance in the middle is 22 and a half feet. You can see that because you're outside of that view, right? You got a broad view. But you stand back here. When everything is future, when everything we're trying to see what God is revealing, most all the time, this is all we get, what's right in front of our eyes, but God allows the prophets to, in their time period, venture out a little bit and see more, right? They see the line. From this, little, from this narrow view, I can see the fourth pillar. I can tell from the top, the oak's a little bit lower, and I can see the whole line of that fourth pillar, but I can't see very much, barely distinguishable. God gave them sometimes a bit more depth of field, right? And so I can come out a little bit more, and I can see the fourth pillar all the way down, but I sure see clearly the third pillar. I can make it out all the way. I can't tell there's... there's uh, and so the, the distance between number four and number three, I can't tell that at all. But from this viewpoint, I can see the distance between number two and number three. There's distance there. Even better yet, between two, number two and number one. So we can tell that there's, the, the, the prophets could gather some information. And I imagine if you were mathematically a genius, somehow you could probably compute that. But I'm sure not. I don't know. What if, what if the fourth pillar was so important and so big and structurally bigger so that when I'm back there looking ahead, it looks as if that last one is closer 
and, and more important, perhaps larger in what it does in value. And so it appears, maybe God has that perspective. Outside of time, you have that perspective. That's how the prophets had a view. They were looking, and God gave them pictures and snapshots of what's out there, but it was not distinguishable all the time. But they knew what God gave them. I want to see a little bit. Let's move on a little bit. Point two. God gave the prophets then near realities of future fulfillments. As they spoke the prophecies, right, that focused on the Messiah and redemption. We went through this earlier in Isaiah chapter 7, the first study that we had. The prophets look out, and they can see that God, from their perspective, their predictive word that God gave them, speaking of the future, that they were, in these prophecies, talking about the coming of Messiah. But there were various means to get to them. That was true for Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 7. There's these little fulfillments that were pictures of, but they're not the total fulfillment of God's prophecy. So God gives these historical means to that final fulfillment. If we wanted to give an example, we could choose the broad category, the day of the Lord. That's the day of the Lord. When Christ comes back, judgment, blessing. How many days of the Lord are there? It's not a trick question. Just one. The day of the Lord. That has a technical sense to it in Scripture, the day of the Lord. It's talking about this day of the return of the promised Messiah. But But to get to that, there's these means to it, little pictures, little harbingers that that God gave them in line to that coming Messiah. My encouragement when we read scriptures, be thinking of what is God doing with what is said, what is declared, how much did they know? Point three, God's promise, the coming Messiah, our deliverer and king, and so he promises his coming. Point A, God's plan for fallen man is what? Is our redemption, right? And and, and that promise is given from the beginning of time to the end of time. I want to go to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we see some good wording here that Paul writes of. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. It says, he chose us in him before the creation of the world. In love, he predestined, he predetermined us that we'd be adopted into his family as his sons with that position, God's sovereign. He sees and he knows. And he chooses you to belong to him. All through Jesus Christ, out of his pleasure and will. You get to verse 7. And he says, in him, Christ. In Christ, we have this redemption. Our sins are paid for. We're covered by his shed blood. Paid the price. Verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. So we get in on this story. Right? Verse 10. To be put into effect. What? At the right moment. God ushers it in at that right point in time. Why? To bring everything together. That's still yet to come when it's all together. But he ends this section with verse 13. For today and for tomorrow. He says, so in the meantime, I've given you the Holy Spirit as a deposit. That's us today. Guaranteeing what is ours yet to come when Jesus Christ returns. All to his praise and glory. God's plan of redemption is first declared where? In the Bible. It's declared at the beginning of time. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, this offspring of Eve after the the fall of of Adam and Eve, the offspring of Eve, God said, will crush the head of Satan while Satan, you will strike his heel. Well, this one who's going to crush Satan has to be beyond human. Ah, man, we, we as human beings can't crush Satan. So it's a spiritual battle that, and and Christ has that victory. The process of redemption started in the Garden of Eden. We also see point B, throughout history, God reveals his plan of redemption more and more. His plan is about the Christ, the Messiah, who will suffer and then reign as king. Those two ideas do not exist alone. They are intertwined. Again, the prophets don't necessarily distinguish between the two very well. I listed in your outline 16 prophecies by date when they were given. And, and, and it's about the Messiah. It's about both his suffering and his rule. And you can look through them, and I encourage you to do that. So what, about, what do we learn about the Messiah's first coming? Right? Point C. 
The Messiah comes bringing redemption, his purpose. John 3, 16, right? God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. John writes in his letter, 1 John 4, 10, that this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he set his son to be the sacrifice, the atoning blood sacrifice for our sin. That's how much he loves us. Redemption. It's the work of Christ for us on our behalf, suffering and dying and satisfying the wrath of God. Redemption. The, the prophets had pictures of that. We've experienced it through Christ. What do we learn about the Messiah? Point D, the Messiah will come reigning in power. The timing of the Messiah is seen as the day of the Lord. Again, a technical point of this, what is going to happen when the Messiah returns to this earth. But he also gave them little pictures of it in judgments and blessings through history, pointing to that final day of delivery. Point two. If it dominates in the Old Testament, it dominates all the more in the New Testament. And I put in your outline uh, how it dominates in the New Testament. You can read that on your own. So if the return of Christ was important to the prophets, it's more important to New Testament writers of which they're writing to us. It's important. Closure. Application. Jesus whose birth we just celebrated. This Jesus isn't just a baby in a, in a manger. It's not a baby story. He is the promised one. He is Yahweh saves. He is great. He is son of highest. He's the one who will reign on David's throne forever. That's who he is. We look at the prophets and we study the prophets. And it our causes us to do two things. Pictures are mixed. The first one is it causes us to just stand in awe and amazement. Wow. But it also needs to get us to get down on our knees, get down on the ground, to say, I will submit my life to you O king, O ruler, my savior. Jesus paid the price for our sin to redeem us and buy us. The story of the Messiah isn't over yet. We're living, waiting for his return, his second coming. So how should that impact us? Four ways, very quickly. The first, as God keeps his word so must we. God is the great promise keeper. His character is that he is the truth. He speaks the truth. God makes his promise. It's going to happen. It's going to be fulfilled. Therefore, since you and I have been born of God, we bear his traits. Thus, we need to bear his trait of being truthful and honest. This world needs to see people of integrity today more than ever. You and I need to be people, men and women, young people, who are full of integrity, who say the truth and speak the truth and live the truth. When we blow it, and we do blow it, because we still sin, we fall up short, and I've made a promise, and I haven't kept my promise to you, and so what do I do? I clear it up with God, and then I come to you, and I say, will you forgive me for breaking my promise, Ben? I got to get it clear. I got to get it clear. And then what do I do? I commit myself to be a truth keeper. That's how we live over and over and over. Let's be committed to speaking and living the truth. The second principle I think out of here is that we need to be living our lives anticipating the return of Jesus. As that diagram depicts, right, we're right on the edge, the brink of the end time events. We don't know when God says now, but he will. Maybe the events are breaking in as we are today. I don't know. We don't know. But we need to live as though it's right on the edge. Because it is. Apostle John, right in 90-ish AD, and he says, we are in the last hour. Go figure, right? 60 minutes, not quite. How about 1,930 years worth of minutes? 
we're ready for Jesus to come again. How did Peter put it in chapter four? He said, the end of all things is near. That's Peter writing. End of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded so you can pray. And, and, and Jesus said, as retor- record, recorded by Mark, right, in his gospel, about the day and the hour nobody knows, not the angels, not me, only the Father knows. Therefore, what does he say next? Be on guard. Be alert. You don't know when that day is going to come, when that hat's going to break in. We, and I, we have to be ready, anticipating. The end of events are going to happen. My call is for us to be kingdom-minded. Be thinking about the kingdom. Now, don't get caught in life and sports and our children and all that we do and things that go wrong and the car needs repair. Listen, in the busyness of your life, in the stress and the pulls that you go through, we all go through them. And I'm not saying ignore them. We've got to do what we've got to do. We're married, we have family, we have children, we have responsibilities, we have a job. Don't quit your day job. But in the midst of it, we have to still think kingdom. I got to live about the kingdom. In the midst of your job, in the midst of the busy life, in the midst of the hecticness, it's still going to be about the kingdom. We do that. Third, Let's, let's, let's ask the question, how ready are we? Point three, the, 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 the return of Christ calls for holy living. John wrote in his letter in chapter three, those who have this hope purify themselves just as he is pure. And you and I gotta ratchet through our lives and say, where am I not living a pure life? How am I not following what Lord is telling me? The truth of his word. And we need to confess those sins and turn from those sins and we need to live that kind of a life of holiness. Lastly, that's what I already said. The coming of Christ should cause us to stand in awe and amazement, but also have us fall in submission to him. Does that describe us? We are amazed at what Christ has done for us. But he's also coming as this mighty king. Can I remind you what what Peter writes This one who is exalted, Peter, Paul wrote, exalted to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's how we have to live. He's ruling today in heaven, controlling. He knows the beginning from the end. We're waiting and we're amazed with him. But he's also, when he comes again, not coming as a baby, but as a mighty warrior. Revelation chapter 19. John says, I I saw the heavens standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. It's coming. His eyes are like blazing fire, on his head are many crowns. The armies of heaven were following him. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. It's Old Testament prophecies. He's not this baby in a manger. He is this warrior who's coming. And on verse 16, on his robe and his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's who he is. So we better fall before him in obedience and be about his business. Let's pray. Heads bowed, let's pray. As we close and then sing about his coming. Those of us as believers, I just want you to click through your life a little bit. Do you need to work on being a truth keeper? Do it. Do we have to live our lives in anticipation, we need to step that up and say, Lord, I need to be more focused on your kingdom as I await Jesus, your return. And we got to be thinking and living that way. Is that true for you? Living for holiness, righteousness, the things that are right and pure. To be amazed at Christ. To be willing to fall below him, before him. Will you pray over the concerns that you have in your life? 
this morning and you've not yet stepped into that personal relationship with Christ, if you die outside of that faith in Christ, Scripture is clear, eternity is hell. We know it's possible that these end time events could break in and we're still alive. We're here. If you haven't braced Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life now, I wouldn't count on it happening then. Maybe you're ready to embrace him, take him, and receive him. You can pray silently. You can, from your heart, you can say, Jesus, I understand you are the Savior. And you came and died for me. Paid the penalty of my sin. And today I turn from those sins and receive you into my life. If that's your simple prayer of faith, let, let me know, one of us staff, we'd love to talk with you. I'm going to sing as we close and sing about a powerful song of Christ returning, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. And until he comes, you and I need to be committed to stand in awe, fall in submission to him, declare the truth of who he is. Let's stand as we sing.